Good morning. Again. Today we're going to be going back to our first John study. And we're going to be looking first John chapter 3. We'd like to specifically turn your attention chapter 3 to verse 19 and following down to the end of the chapter. And this is something that we must have. Uh, my Bible says, if you're not on the King James, the Bible usually says confidence before God or something like that above the, the pericope, which uh, that's what that's called. But uh, usually it says something like confidence before God or something like that. We, we should have confidence before God. We should have confidence without boasting. There's a difference between confidence and boasting. Boasting is, look what I've done. Confidence is, I, I know that I, if, if I go to God, He will answer. That's confidence before God. And we're to have that. We're to have that confidence that when we go before God, or when we have an issue in our life, that we should understand that God will answer. God will intervene in some way. We should know, we should have the confidence that God will do that. So turn, turn with me if you're there. Verse 19, following down in chapter 3 of 1 John. By this we know that we are of the truth and shall reassure our hearts before Him. For if our hearts condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we will receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in Him, in His sight. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he commanded us. Now the one who keeps his commandments remains in him, and he in, and he in him. He, and, and by this we know that he remains in us, through the Spirit of whom he has given us. Now, we're to have confidence before God. And there's one thing that we know, that is, if when our heart is right, we can have confidence before God. Because we understand and we know that that confidence comes from a right heart. Right heart, right attitude, right speech, all that, all that good stuff. Right heart before God. It's like when we, when we talked about in the James study we did in chapter 3 where we're tame, trying to tame the tongue and how the tongue is wicked and it, and it lashes out and, and, and it's an unruly member. But one of the things that we have to understand also is the dynamic of the heart when it comes to our speech. The tongue only speaks out what's in the heart. The Bible says that the abundance of the heart and the mouth speaks. So if we have a right heart, we can have confidence in God. If we don't have a right heart, we don't have confidence in God. It's one of those things where, and it goes beyond, I want you to understand, this goes beyond the, the fear and the doubt that we all feel when something happens and we're not sure if God hears or God answers, we're not sure. It goes beyond that. It goes beyond the wrong heart or the heart that is not right. It goes beyond that and, and it goes to the place where we really believe we really feel that God does not hear. We have given up on the promise of God. And that's what this is talking about here. If we have a right heart before God, we can have confidence that even though we might feel that God doesn't hear us, we know within ourselves that God does really hear. God is really there. God really does answer our prayer. We may not like the answer, but God does answer our prayer. Now, he says here, By this we know that we are of the truth that, and shall reassure our hearts before Him. We have confidence in God and love for one another. We know that we can have confidence and be reassured. 
This is right after the, the section that where, where, where John talks about loving one another as Christ loved us. We're to love one another, and in all of that, in all of the workings of the Christian life, this morning in Sunday school, the brief time that we were here, we talked about the, how the body works together. How in, I don't remember what chapter that was in, in Ephesians, I think it was, wasn't it? In Ephesians 4, it was Ephesians 4, I remember. It talks about how the body works together. And that is an analogy of it's talking about the human body working together. It's an analogy of the church and how the church should work together and how it should be supporting and holding one another up. You can't do that if you don't have love for one another. You can't do that. You have to have that love for one another in order to do that. And that, and that takes a right heart to, in, in order to do that. And with that right heart, we, we, we hold one another up we support one another, we, we love one another, we, we do things for one another, we take care of one another, and we have confidence that God is working. God is doing things. God is answering prayers. We have confidence in God. Confidence in Him, confidence in His Word. One of the things that chips away at that confidence and the right heart is the lack of spending time in God's Word. The lack of spending time with God. And I know we are all busy, and I know we're all... But it is so important to spend the time. And I've said that. How many times have I said that in this church? It is so important to spend the time. Because that is where we gain our strength. That is where we gain our ability to, to know what God wants to do. And that's where the faith is built up and the confidence is built up and, and, and the faith to believe God to do what He says He's going to do. It's time spent in here. Time spent with Him in prayer. Time spent in church around others that can build us up as the body works together. If you take one of those things out, either coming here for church or not reading your Bible every day or not praying consistently, if you take one of those things out or put one of those things on the back burner, it begins to chip away at your confidence before God. And you've got to have confidence before God. Now, <coughs> Excuse me. It says, Beloved, if our hearts, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. What's our heart like? Talked about how the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A person, you can tell a person where a person is in the Lord by attitudes, actions, and speech. Now, people have bad days. Don't get me wrong. We all have bad days, but if it's an acute, constant thing, you can kind of tell where a person's heart is, where they are in God. And it, it's basically, well, what happens is basically taking a bad day and dwelling on a bad day. And then another bad day, and dwelling on a bad day, and then the attitude begins to change, and the heart begins to change, and the speech begins to change, and then something begins to happen. You dwindle away at that confidence before God. When you're like that, well, God can't hear me anymore because I'm far from Him. That's not confidence in God. That's confidence in our surroundings and our understanding. God loves us. God desires for us to have confidence. If our heart cannot condemn us, we can have confidence. That means guard our heart. Keep our heart pure. Keep a short account with the Lord. What does that mean? Every single night as we pray, God, if I've done something wrong today, reveal it that I may repent. If I've looked at something that I shouldn't have looked at, if I've said something to someone I shouldn't have said, if I have written down something or thought of something I shouldn't have thought about, reveal it that I might repent. Keeping our heart right with God and repenting 
of those things. They might have seemed small, seemed small in the moment. Maybe someone rubbed us the wrong way. And that happens a lot. We might have had a wrong attitude, a wrong thought about someone. Maybe a workmate, a family member, whatever. Seems small at the moment, but if you let it fester, it'll begin to chip away at your confidence before God. And your, and your heart will begin to be changed. We must ask God to reveal those things that we must repent and allow God to more work and move in our life. Because God will do that. God will help us. God will help us to repent. And God wants us to be better than we are right now in this very moment. You might be having a great day. You might be having a great day today in God. You might be you know, on the mountaintop. God desires greater than our mountaintop experiences for us. God desires greater than our valley experiences for us. I cherish the valley experiences. So you might say, well, you're going through a lot of things, but the valley experience is where you learn to build confidence in God. Valley experience is where you grow in God, where you put yourself in, immersed in God's Word to grow and to just get confidence before God. Those valley experiences... The, the, the mountaintop experiences are easy because everything's going right and God's moving and God's blessing and that's a good thing. Don't get me wrong, it's a good thing, but there's not a lot of growth. There's maybe faith is being built up, but growth in waiting on God, growth in knowing what God wants to do with you, knowing and, knowing and, and understanding what God's will is, those kinds of things happen in the valley experiences and those kinds of things is where we grow in confidence in God in a right heart before God in all of those things now it says and whatever we ask we will receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight now if we aren't doing the things that are pleasing to God, does God have an obligation to answer our prayer? No. He really doesn't. He's merciful and He will answer, but does He really have an obligation to do so? If we are far away from, from God and we call out to God, does he, is He really obligated to do answer? No. He's not. But He does because He's merciful. And He loves us. And He desires for us to do right before Him. Our heart, though, must be right. And if we are doing what is pleasing in His sight, He will move on our behalf. He will move on our behalf. He will do great things. He will do great things for us. And this is His commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He's commanded us. Now listen. <clears throat> we dealt the whole eight verses with loving one another. And this isn't the only spot in Scripture where it talks about loving one another. And yet He says again, we are to love one another. Why? Why? You think that's an important thing? To love one another? Yeah, we, yeah, you know, I mean, it's easy for Jim and Sandy to love one another. It's easy for Brenda and Wayne to love one another. It's easy for me and Amy to love one another. It's easy for those that are married. Ralph, I'm sure it was easy to love your wife. Okay? But what about when I do something or Wayne does something or Jim does something that rubs one of us the wrong way, is it easy to love each other in that circumstance? Not really. Not really. But we're called to do that, aren't we? Why? Because Jesus loved those who put His hands and His feet on those wood planks and nailed them there. Now, Jim's not going to do that to me, and he's not going to do that to Ralph, and I'm not going to do that to any one of you. 
But yet, boy, we get our feelings hurt, and boy, we're, we have problems. We don't like those people anymore. But Jesus got nailed to a cross, beat and scourged, and his beard pulled out, unrecognizable to the eye. That's how bad it was. And yet he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He had love for the people that were killing him. And yet he says, love one another. And how hard is that for us to love one another? As church people, in churches, in, in big churches and small churches, I've been in, I've been in both. I was an assistant pastor in, in, in a small church, and, I've, I, and, I, and I, I attended a big church, and I'll tell you what, it's hard for people to love one another in those settings, and I don't know why. But it's hard. <coughs> People get their feelings hurt. People get upset. And by golly, they leave the church. They don't feel loved anymore. We talked about that this morning. That's another valley experience. Where we learn to grow in grace and knowledge of God. Through those times. How, 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 how many of us know church hoppers or, or have known church hoppers in our life? And what I mean by that is people that go to a church for a while, get upset, leave the church, go to a different one, get upset, go to a different... How, 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 how many of us know people like that? Okay? I do. We all do, I'm sure. Do those people ever grow in grace and knowledge of God? I would dare to say no, because they're always looking for the church to agree with them, and when the church does not, that's when they leave. So there is no growth. It is in those times when, yes, and we're going to rub each other the wrong way. It's going to happen. We're human. We live in a sin-fallen world. We're subject to the sin nature. We're going to rub each other the wrong way. God says when that happens, we are to love one another through it. Yeah, you're going to get mad. Yeah, I might get mad. You might get mad at me or at each other or vice versa. But do we leave the church for that? No. We sit down, we calmly, calmly talk about it and pray for each other and forgive and we move on. That's growth. That's love. That's doing the work of God. That's doing the work of of the church God desires that we're to love one another in the good times and the bad times good times and the bad times and that's why there is so much divorce because people don't love their spouses in the good times and the bad times the bad times, boy, you do it. Do this so many times, that's going to be. We're going to be. We're going to be done. We're going to be done. I'm not doing it anymore. You do this more than once, and we're going to be done. Now there are there are biblical expressions for divorce, infidelity, and and those, and abandonment, and those kinds of things. But simple arguments and disagreements, people get divorced over disagreements. No, grow in grace, in God, in God being in the center. Right? Love one another. That's why the church and the relationship with Jesus Christ is a marriage analogy because we are to love one another through the good times and the bad times and grow together. It doesn't matter if we have 10 people, 12 people, 4 people, 25 people, 100 people. We are to grow together in God. Now, he says, now, that one, now, now the one who keeps his commandments remains in him and he in him. The one who, remain, who keeps his commandments... I keep God's commandments, you keep God's commandments. God, you remain in God and God remains in you. That, that, that statement has been made throughout Scripture. Boom, 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 boom in the epistles. 
If you keep God's commands, He remains in you and you in Him. That's the promise. We just said that we want to have confidence before God. That's how we have it. We we'll remain in God so He can remain in us. We must remain in God. We must love one another. We must uh, do His will. Do His command. Spend time in the Word of God. Spend time in His uh, presence in prayer. This year, next tomorrow, is another year. What are we going to do for next year? I don't do New Year's resolutions, but I try to improve on the previous year. So think about that. Think about the improvements you're going to try to make, spiritually speaking. Sure, you know, I'm getting kind of fat. I was told the other day that my, bowl, my belly shakes like a bowl full of jelly and I look like Santa Claus. I was told that the other day by my older son. Okay? So understand that maybe weight loss might be one of my goals for 2018. But what am I going to do, spiritually speaking, for 2018? Am I going to spend more time in God? I actually started already something that I want to do and I've been doing something called strolling through the epist or strolling through the, the the psalms and what I'm doing is I'm taking one a psalm a day I'm reading it praying over it dissecting it allowing God to speak to me through it and then I'm writing these things down I've been doing this already I'm on psalm number 2 I started this last night so I'm, I'm on Psalm number 2 today. So I'm doing these things and I'm journaling what God is showing me or, or speaking to me so that I can have that as a record. That is something that I'm going to try to do for 2018. What are some things that you're going to do for 2018? Spiritually speaking. We need to think about those things. Maybe you've been thinking about it already, but we need to think about those things. Because when we do that, that's how we build confidence in God and again, confidence in, in His Word and what He's going to do for us. Those, those are the ways we do those things. We are to keep His commandments. And if we do that, then He is in us and we are in Him. We have confidence And by this we know that He remains in us through the Spirit whom has given Him uh, has, has given us. He has given us. God gave us the Holy Spirit. God gave us the Holy Spirit for conviction, for exhortation, for edification, for uh, exaltation of God. The things that you feel in your life that, that you, there are times you, you know you know there are times when you might be down and you might have uh, feel depressed or sad or whatever and you feel that that comfort that comes. That's the Holy Spirit bringing comfort. There might be times when you're reading your word and you feel that God is, is, is speaking something to you. That's the Holy Spirit. You might feel like you have to do something. God is calling you to do something. You, you, that's the Holy Spirit. God gave us the Holy Spirit. The active part of the Trinity, they call Him, right? He is the Spirit. He is the one that when we need to be corrected, He's the one that God sends to be our convictor. Not our condemner. The enemy condemns. The Holy Spirit convicts that we might turn and ask God for help. He's the one that will show us, Ah, you know what, Josh? Your heart's not in the right spot. You need to get it where it needs to be. And does that hurt? Does that, does that hurt? Does that kind of, you know, pinch a little bit? Yeah, it does. But we have to do it, don't we? If we want to have confidence before God, we have to do that. We have to have that, 
that ability to be molded and shaped in God's image, right? We have to have the ability to be teachable by God and apply God's laws and God's commands to our heart. We have to be able to be molded, to have confidence in God. I heard something sometime, one time, one time, I was watching, I love watching the Gaither videos. And I was watching one with Mark Lowry. And Mark Lowry is, is a comedian. He cracks me up. He was talking about, he was, he's, a, he's an independent fundamental Baptist. And he was talking about Jesus going and raising the dead. And, you know, Jesus never passed a funeral without raising the dead. And he said, never, he, he said, Jesus, I, I hope Jesus never raises any, anyone in our church because we'll have to raise us all. Okay? He was saying that, all, that every, everyone in his church was dead spiritually. Okay? Do we want to have that in our life? Do we want to be spiritually dead? Because what's going to happen if we begin to, to shut down that application of God's um, apply, applying to our life, we begin to dwindle away at the confidence, we begin to dwindle away at our relationship, and then we end up back where we were. This begins to not mean anything anymore. Prayer begins to be a chore. Journaling begins to be a chore. And do we really want that? I don't want that for me. And I certainly don't want that for you. So we have to understand that God loves us. We might feel like God's got our thumb on us, but we start, start to spiritually die when we say, get your thumb off me, God, I don't want to deal with it. Okay? When God puts his thumb on us, whether me or you or anyone else, we are to say, okay, God, I see. Let's work this out. Let's work on it. What do I need to do to change? That's how we stay in God. That's how we have confidence before God. Because He doesn't do that if He didn't love us. He doesn't do that if He didn't love us. My kids down there, they knew you know, how good they were back there all through the whole thing. They knew what was going to happen to them if they weren't. Because I told them on the way here, this is what's going to happen to you if you're not good. And I'm one to keep my promises. So they understood that they needed to sit back there. And God keeps His promises. God keeps His promises. And if we're in Him and He does this because He loves us, it's not to make us worse. It's to build us up and have confidence in Him. If He's going to keep the promises of discipline, He's going to keep the promises of reward. That's the confidence we can have in God. That's the confidence we can have in God. So, it's about time for them to come up. Let's go ahead and pray. And they can come up here when we're done praying. And we have our hymn already picked out for the thing. So let's go ahead and turn to that as well. You can have, your, have that open after communion. Heavenly Father... Lord, we thank you for today and we thank you for your word. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your grace. And Lord, help us today, the end of another year, Lord, to put aside the, the, and do away with, Lord, those feelings of what we may have done to disappoint you, where we have, feel we've fallen a short, fallen short, where we feel we've done wrong. Lord, we pray that right now that you would help us to put those things aside, to pick ourselves up, brush ourselves off, start this year off anew and afresh, and move forward in you. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would bless each and every person that's in this sanctuary and down in the basement with your presence. And Lord, with a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory, give each and every one of us today 
And for the rest of 2018, a hunger for your word, a hunger for your spirit, a hunger for the things of God today to last throughout 2018 and to grow in the grace and knowledge of you. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to touch those that are not with us today. Joanne, encourage her, bless her, lift her up. Give her joy and peace today as well. Minister to her by your Holy Spirit and give her strength. Give her joy. Give her confidence in God today. Be with Lois. Give her healing in her body. Lord, give her healing in her lungs, in her head, and in her whole body, Lord, from top of her head to the soles of her feet. May she feel the presence of God right now in Jesus' name. And I ask right now that you would also give her confidence in God that you would move upon her life. Lord, you have no age restriction. You have no uh, uh, gender restriction. Lord, you are not a respecter of person. You can use anyone who would desire to be used, regardless of gender, age, or, 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 or status in the community, or whatever the case. Lord, just be with us. Guard us. Undergird us. Strengthen us for another year to serve you by your Holy Spirit. And minister to us, minister through us, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. Well, let's see. I've got both phones, so I can't call her to, up here. Okay. Get up here now! <laughs> <laughs> and we have a hymn of 89 so I'll turn theirs myself 89, 89, 89 we'll be in uh, 1 Corinthians here they come Here they come. Have a seat. Have a seat. We are not... What? Why did I do that? Thank you. Thank you. You need to go sit down. We're doing communion. First Corinthians chapter 11. Go ahead and then if you want to go ahead and as you're, you can turn there and then you can pass those out. That's okay. I'll wait. Oh. There's a reason I hate new shoes. Yeah. They're breaking me in what they're doing.
1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. I have received of the Lord that which I have delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ralph, would you pray over the bread, please? Thank you, Lord. Jesus didn't come to earth because of Simon and the guy who gave his body and sacrifice for us. Help us be mindful of how great this is and what the privilege we have to serve him and ask for Jesus. Let's take together. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. In the same manner, he took the cup. After he had supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Wayne, would you pray over the cup, please? Would you pray over this, please? Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for his sacrifice. May you bless us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. As we go into our hymn, I want us to think about a couple things. Number one, never take what we just did lightly. The Bible says down in here that we are to not take the Lord's Supper unworthily. Which means that if we, that our heart must be right to do so. So as we talked this morning about having a right heart before God, that should always be the desire of us as we take communion. Number two, this today should be a beginning what we just did, a beginning, a new commitment, a new covenant with God for another year of doing great things in Him, doing, growing in Him, getting uh, deeper in His Word, deeper in His desire for us, and deeper in a relationship. So with those two things in mind, let's go with our hymn in remembrance of the little baby that was born for us.
Thank you for being here today. Uh, once again, let today be a beginning of another year with God, a greater year with God. Press in to God. Press into His love for you and allow Him to do works in you. And allow him get into his word more and more. All of this is wrought in prayer. All of this is wrought in desire of what God would want you to do. Spend time and ask God. Make a new commitment tomorrow morning or tonight or whatever, how long, how early you stay up. But make a new commitment with God, first and foremost. Resolutions like weight loss and all that stuff. That's good too, but the most important thing is your new relationship in God. What you're going to do to be better for 2018 than you were for 2018, 2017. We all need to improve. We all can improve. And therefore we should seek it. So, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.